Hello, and welcome to the CCF online channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. Now let me show you a few pictures here and try to guess who are these people and what are the things that are common to them. So if you are in the 60s, black and white, you may know this guy. So if you know him, kindly whisper to your neighbor. If not, so this is Ernest Hemingway, the man of men. He is a popular novelist, journalist, and writer, and he affected the young men in his era in the 60s. And then he committed suicide by putting a double barrel gun in his mouth. Another one, look at those seductive eyes. So if you are in the 60s, yes, Marilyn Monroe. So he died, or she, she is a model, actress, singer, very popular during her time, and she died of barbiturate overdose. You know this woman? Whitney Houston. Okay, it's Whitney Houston. So she died in 2011 of intoxication of drug that when she was taking a bath in her uh, bathroom, in the bathtub, she drowned because of drug intoxication. Recently, you know this guy, the voice of genie in Aladdin and the famous actor for so many popular movies, Robin Williams. So he hung in the ceiling in his bedroom died of asphyxiation, so he strangled himself. So, nagbigti. You know this guy for the Filipinos? So, former Secretary of Defense and Chief of Staff of the Arroyo government, Angelo Reyes, so oh, he shot his heart in front of his mother's grave. So, that is General Angelo Reyes. So this may not be popular, but this name may ring a bell. So her name is Cristel Tejada, a 16-year-old University of the Philippines Manila student and who was denied to take her final exam because she was never given a loan of 10,000 pesos. So she took her life by drinking silver cleaning liquid. So she died. And what is the common thing for this persons, these people. It is depression that leads to suicides. So there is a study, Filipinos top depressed, or the Filipinos are the top depressed people in Southeast Asia. 4.5 million depressed people. That is the highest in Southeast Asia. There is a uh, column, okay, Seven Filipinos commit suicide every day. So this is July 25, 2016. And an estimated number of suicides in 2012, that is 2,558, 550 female, and 2,009 male. So this is a real thing. This is not just some very light thing to be discussed, but it has to be dealt with seriously. And we have to ask the Word of God which is the solid foundation of truth about life, about morality, about godliness, about sin, and about eternity. That is where we should start and find some answers, how to diffuse or overcome depression. So what is depression? Depression is a state of mind that exists when the heart is pressed down and unable to experience joy. So it is a state of mind, how the mind thinks, how the mind perceives things around him, whether real or fictional or the past, the present, and the future. So when the state of the mind is, when the heart is pressed down, a lot of things comes to his mind and he will be unable to experience joy. Those suffering with depression feel trapped underneath a dark heavy blanket of sadness, grief, and hopelessness. So this is real. Depression from the word depressed 
means to press down to a lower position. So if this is your normal position, when something is heavy, that position will be lowered down. So it's going to be depressed. So it's like if you see a road construction, before a cement is poured on the road, a road roller compactor will go there back and forth how many times in order to compact the soil and make it hard. So make it depressed. So there is going to be a pressing down or to lower, lowering down. So in the human heart, when there is so much tragedy, when there is so much pain, when there is so much hopelessness, we are placed in a lower position. In other words, the person is disheartened, discouraged, saddened, or to lower in spirit, to make gloomy, loss of hope and confidence or courage. So this is depression. It is used by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened. That's the word, burdened or weighed down. The Greek word for that is bareo or pressed down or weighed down because of the persecution of the Jews. And when Paul was running uh, for his life, when he was experiencing persecution among the, the Pharisees, he was being pressed down excessively or beyond credi credible, normal, day-to-day -day stress. So it's beyond or burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired. So there is now that desperation, meaning loss of hope. So this being despaired and being depressed are synonymous terms by themselves because losing of hope is due to being weighed down. So depression is a result of emotional heaviness that weighs the heart down. So whatever events in our life that will cause our hearts to sink, that is depression. That is something that weighs down the heart. If the heart is formally joyful, full of hope, full of encouragement to look at the future, when it is no more there, it is weighed down and it is an emotional heaviness we call depression. So what are the signs of depression? Loss of interest in usual activities. So we may be interested in uh, doing things, but later we lost interest in these things. Feelings of worthlessness. I don't have any value. I am ugly. I am fat. I don't look handsome anymore. I don't look beautiful anymore. Amoy lupa na ako. I smell like rotten egg or what? Weight gain or loss. Sudden increase of weight. Wala ka nang ginawa, but eat because you're so depressed or you don't eat anymore, then suddenly you became anorexic. And sleep disturbances, you cannot sleep anymore because there are so many things in your mind. The creditors are running after you or somebody is threatening your life because uh, of some issues that were unresolved before. And probably lethargy. What's lethargy? It's not the letter that comes before G. It's not letter F. So it's lethargy, meaning no power, sleepy or dull. Another sign of depression is hyperactivity. If you cannot sleep, what, you, what do you do in the wee hours of the morning? You go to the gym, do your push-up, carry weights, run around in your subdivision or in your village, 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning because you cannot sleep because you have so much in your mind. Purposelessness. You have no purpose. Everybody will invite you and say, okay, let's go there, let's drink, or let's go there, let's just pass the time around, though you have so many things to do for the day, anxiety and anger. So you become so anxious and you are so edgy, you are so touchy that you cannot control yourself anymore. You easily get angry when your darling will ask you, honey, can you come with me? Let's go to the market or let's fix something in the house. No, I'm too busy. Like that. Or maybe your friends will just ask you something and then you just want to control yourself, but there is always that simmering anger inside your heart because of depression. Frequent and overwhelming willing feelings of sadness. You just cry for no reason. Frequently. Slow thinking, 
difficulty in concentrating. So that's something. And even suicidal thoughts. When you see that life is no longer worth living, when you cannot see the bright side of life anymore, you are tempted to end your life in whatever way available. That is a suicidal thought. So all of these things are depression signs. So the question now is, who do we ask for answers? Or in other words, how do we diffuse the landmine of depression? Praise God, we have the answer. We have the Word of God. Our Word of God, the Bible, will teach us how to diffuse the landmine of depression. We may seek for answers to some gurus or there, are, there is nothing wrong with going to psychologists and psychiatrists provided they give us the right answer and it is biblically founded because it is really a mind issue, a state of the mind. So the lesson that we're going to learn this morning is hope in God. That is how we, de we overcome and thrive on depression. Depression is a disorderly state of mind. Therefore, depression is overcome by putting our minds in order. So when we are depressed, our minds are going anywhere uncontrollably because it is disorderly state. It is going anywhere. And the best way is we put our minds into order. So how do we put our minds into order? We have to understand what depression is and how do we thrive upon it. Is it, is depression only for people who are having less in life? Is it depression exclusive to people who have so much in life? Or is it depression for, for all? We'll all be depressed. So we have to think right. We have to think biblically. We have to also understand that depression comes over to most, if not all, of us. So you will hear, easily hear people, even children in high school or even elementary will say, I am depressed, 14-year-old children. Or 40-year-old guys, 60, 70, 80. We will at one time or another experience fits of depression discouragement, disillusionment, disenchantment. It will happen to us. There will be days that we will be going through life in barren wilderness. Nobody is exempted. So when we understand that nobody is exempted, then we will forewarn ourselves. We will arm ourselves with a very weapon that will keep us safe from this landmine. So depression comes over to most, if not all, of us. Chuck Swindoll says, the biographies of eminent ministers prove that seasons of fearful frustrations have fallen to the lot of most, if not all of them. So even the great men of the Bible also experience this depression. And to give you some examples, we have David. Then King David said to Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, Let the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. So this, the context here is Absalom rebelled against King David. Absalom was his son, and then he, he mustered 20,000 of his men, and then David also pursued these this rebels with the same number, and Joab, along the way, killed Absalom. So when Joab told the Cushite messenger to tell David that Absalom died, so this was the news. And what happened there was the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So he was grieving because of the death of his son. And that is very normal, having a son dying before the father. It's really very difficult. I also had experienced that one time in my life when my second child 
pass away. So I, I know where I'm coming from. There will be depression. You will see, oh Lord, what's happening to me. That's why David was saying, oh Absalom, my son, my son. But God is still very good. So he replaced my son with another son. And now he's already 16 years old. Praise God for that. But we, including David, will experience this fits of depression. And even Jonah, you remember Jonah who was caught by the big fish. He was mad and angry with God. The story goes like Jonah was told by God to, to go and preach to Nineveh about repentance. And then he was disobedient. He was swallowed by the fish and brought back to Nineveh. And then when he preached repentance to the people of Nineveh, they repented. And instead of rejoicing, Jonah got mad. And he was depressed because they repented. And so what happened? He said, therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me. Let me die. Mamatay na ako. For death is better to me than life. So he was depressed. And his depression was because the Ninevites repented. Another one, great man of the Bible, Job. He lost everything. Literally lost everything. But he stayed faithful even in all of these difficult times that he had, that even his wife told him, will you remain in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he remained faithful in God. But throughout this difficulty, Job experienced this depression. What did he say? Why did I not perish at birth? Bakit hindi nala ako namatay nung ako'y pinanganak and die as I came from the womb? I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. He was going through this suffering, he was suffering boils, his flock and his possessions were all destroyed, and his children all died. I loathe my own life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in bitterness of my soul. So these are great men of the Bible. We also have Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who was even told by God not to have his own family, but to pray and instruct the nation of Israel to come back to God. And then during his time of great desperation, he was depressed. He said, curse be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me. Why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? This is Jeremiah. And who are we to say that we will not be experiencing this at any time or another? So we have to understand that life will not be all roses. Life of a Christian is not a bed of roses there will be a lot of thorns under it. So we have to understand that life will not be painted. We should not be deluded that life will be always happy and gay. But there will be times that we will shiver in fear. There will be times that we'll be shivering because of the attacks of the enemy and the circumstances around us. But thanks be to God we have the solution to thrive in this depression. God will not eliminate this immediately. God will bring it to us for a certain purpose. And what are these reasons? Chuck Swindoll says, fits of depression come over to most of us. The strong are not always vigorous. The wise, not always ready. The brave, not always courageous. The joyous, not always happy. So this is, these are the fits of depression. Uh, kindly fix the projector. Okay, thank you very much. So the strong of us will not always be strong. There are times of weaknesses. The wise, when we thought we have all figured it out in this world, we're not always ready. And when we are brave at times, there will be circumstances in our lives that we will be overwhelmed. We will be fearful at times. And there will be joys, or there will always be time that we are not happy, but we will be sad. 
because it's reality. And so, how do we overcome these moments? We have to hope in God. That is the title of our message this morning. Hope is the conviction of things that we hope for and the evidence of things unseen. So that is Hebrews 11 verse 1. Psalm 42 verse 11 says, Why are you downcast or why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? He was talking to himself. He was not pointing his finger to other people. The psalmist was talking to himself. Hope in God. That's our title. For I shall yet praise him, the, the help of my countenance and my God. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Unhappy Christians, to say the least, are a poor recommendation for a Christian faith. So if if this is the case, he said, so the devil's one object is to depress God's people that he can go to the world and say, there are God's people. Do you want to be like that? So in order for the devil to be successful in dissuading people to commit their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will try to attack Christians or believers and make them depress people so that when they walk around, you cannot see brilliance in them. You cannot see joy in their lives. You cannot see happiness in their countenance. They will walk in sadness and gloom so that Satan will tell to the rest of the world, do you want to be like those people? Do you want to be like them? Nobody would like to be in the company of sad people. Of course, we would like to be in the company of joyful people. We want to be in the company of people who will also infect us with their joy or with their happiness and that is why the devil will always work 24 7 to depress people he will always attack people to make them depressed so let's now go to one beautiful or one great character in the bible by the name of elijah the prophet so the story goes like this he also experienced this depression. So when Ahab saw him, referring to Elijah, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped images of Baal instead. So this is the story. Ahab was saying, you, Elijah, are the troublemaker because Elijah prayed that there will be a severe drought in the entire kingdom of Israel. And when, God, when, when, when Elijah prayed, according to James 5, 17, he was a man, human as we are, and when he prayed, there was no rain for three and a half years. And because of this, judgment came upon the northern kingdom that there was drought. And Ahab blamed Elijah, and he was looking for him. And that's why he say, you are the troublemaker. But in reality, Elijah was telling people to repent and turn away from idolatry. And when they met, he says, you are the troublemaker. And what happens now is when they face to face, they came face to face, Elijah said, now summon all Israel to join 450 prophets of Baal and 400 of Asherah. It's like we are about 500 here, sitting capacity, so more or less, mga 500 plus tayo. And the second service also, another, uh, first service is another 400. So you imagine this many are the prophets of Baal and Asherah combined. And there will be a showdown there. And the showdown is, Elijah said, okay, gather all your prophets and then we will make an offering. You will make an altar, bring two bulls and then chop them together and put them there. And make it a sacrifice and I will also cut a bull into pieces and will offer it in another altar. And then we pray to our gods. You pray to your Baal and Asherah and I'll pray to the Lord my God. And the one who answers by fire, by burning everything in the altar is the true God. And then they say, okay, let's, let's do it. It's a deal. And then what happens next? The prophets of Asherah and, and Baal, they were praying since morning until noontime until evening. And then there was no response. So they were hobbling around the altar, praying, then cutting themselves. And then they were 
asking and there was no response. And then Elijah was even taunting them, Okay, pray to your God some more. He may be sleeping. He may be awake. Gisingin niyo siya or he may be taking a poo. He may be in the CR or in the comfort room. So pray and pray. So he was really very brave, very courageous. And then in the evening, what happened there at the usual time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel. So you imagine this is nighttime and so dark, only torch can be seen with 400 or 800, 850 worshipers and all the people, spectators all over the place. And he was praying, O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. And that was the prayer of Elijah. Very short. What happens? Immediately after the prayer, in contrast to those worshipers of Baal and the Asherah, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven. So with sound effects. So it's like that. So suddenly, and burn up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. So tagagang natuyo, tigang na tigang, and everything was burned. And what happens next? And, the, and when the, all the people saw it, they fell face down to the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. So they were all convinced. And I think Elijah was so ecstatic at that time. I am a real servant of God and God of the heavens is the real God. So he was really jumping for joy. He was at the summit of victory. And that's the experience of Elijah. And what happens next? Then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal. So being alone with his servant, he just said, seize all the 850. So who sees the 850? All the spectators and even the 850 false prophets were trembling because they are fighting the great God. Even Elijah was standing up alone by himself. So look at the courage of Elijah. He said, seize all the prophets. Don't let a single one escape so that the people seize them all. And Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. So imagine there was so much bloodshed there. There were no guns. Or probably it's just spear and what you call that? The sword. So, so maybe others were beheaded. Others were gutted out with their, with their intestines around. So there was blood flowing all over the place. Because that was the judgment of the people or the prophets, the false prophets. So you see, Elijah was really very victorious that day. So he was on the mountain hill of victory because he was so happy. He was really up there in cloud nine, savoring the victory for God. And later he said, Elijah said to Ahab, go get something and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So not only did the Lord said that he is the real God, he is already stopping the severe drought for the entire kingdom of Israel. Remember, there was a three and a half years drought before that. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought the terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and run ahead of Ahab, Ahab's chariot, all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. So Ahab run because probably it's miraculous, not only probably, but I believe it's, it was miraculous that he was given super strength because Ahab was riding a chariot and he outran the chariot of Ahab and he arrived at the gate of Jezreel before Ahab arrived. Jezreel is a place like a rest house of the king which is basically residing in his own palace in Sidon, so farther above north. And Ahab 
told Jezebel all, the, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Elijah, when he went home and then talked to his wife Jezebel, he was taking a blow-by-blow blow account. It's like the fight of Mani Pacquiao and Mayweather and you say every moment what really happened, what really took place. And he said, all the prophets of Baal were slaughtered in front of me and I was just amazed because everybody was still caught in the amazement that immediately after Elijah prayed, there was a flash of lightning that devoured all the offerings in the altar. So instead of Jezebel being amazed and overwhelmed by the report of Ahab, his husband, his weak husband, Jezebel did not find in his heart, in her heart, a heart of repentance. Look what happened here. If you look at the second verse, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more. If I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. They were already in Jezreel. And then he say, 24 hours from now, you are history. You will be dead. So with that kind of threatening, what happened to Elijah? Remember, Elijah was in the cusp of victory. He was in the summit of of glorious victory after that great battle. So what happened? And he was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So after he was up in victory, he's now going down or sliding down in the valley of defeat. So where is this? So that star is Mount Carmel, and 17 southeast of that is Jezreel, that star. So after that showdown in Mount Carmel, Ahab went there first, and Elijah came later on. And after he was afraid of the threatenings of Jezebel, he ran south, which is about 100 miles down or 170 kilometers down of Jezreel. So he ran and then he left his servant there. So he was so afraid that he was so alone by himself that he, he left his servant there. I, mean, I have to go somewhere else. And usually people who are depressed wants to pull the shades down and want to be away from anyone, doesn't want to hear any counsel, doesn't want to hear any advice even from well-meaning people. And that's what's happening to Elijah. And then, after going to Beersheba, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He went to the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree or a tree or a broom tree where the, it's like an acacia tree where the leaves are spread laterally so that you can take a wonderful shade underneath. And he sat down and under it, he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. So he sat down and then he requested that his life would be emptied, ended. Now think about this. Elijah was very, very successful in his battle with the great prophets or the false prophets of, of Asherah and Baal, and there are 850 of them. And then expecting that when he goes to Jezreel, when Ahab will be talking to Jezebel, but Jezebel did not repent. So Elijah was thinking to himself, I must have failed. So I will throw the towel instead of looking for people who will repent, people who have so much influence over the nation so that when they demolish or remove all idols and idol worship, then the nation will go back to God. But it did not happen. The thing that he expected the most. So he said, I am defeated. Take my life, O Lord. I'm not better than my fathers. So what are the three things that makes us despair? Things that I believe should never have happened, but they occurred. 
you expected something to happen. Like for example, you want your business to prosper. You want your business to succeed. But by any force of circumstances or by faith, something happened that is, not beyond, that is beyond your control. So it occurred and then you start to get depressed. Or probably you are thinking of preparing for your board exam and then despite your preparation, you still failed. Or you prepare, you are having a wonderful relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend and suddenly when you, when you ask the girl, will you marry me? And he said, no, I cannot. So you will be saddened. Or if, if somebody or maybe a friend of yours is, was part of the SAF 44 in Mama Sapano and then you expected him to arrive home jolly and happy and then coming home already in the coffin with a flag draped around it. So those things will make us despair. Another one is the reverse of it. Things that I am convinced will happen you're so excited that they will happen. You're 80% sure that they will happen, but they do not. Like for example, you think that you are living a healthy life. You do exercise. You have the right diet. You have the right food. But when you go to the doctor and then the doctor say, scratching his head and then said, Oh, I have this thing that is really not a good news. I am saying that you will have three months to live because of something. That's a reality that is beyond our control. Another one is things that I believe should happen right now and it did not happen till way, way later. God is withholding something and then we get depressed because we cannot wait. We want it to happen now, but God placed us there so that we will accomplish the purposes that God has in us. That's why it will only happen way, way later. So these are the things that makes us despair. So our message again is to hope in God. Now we, we use an acrostic just to make us remember what Hope is all about. So the meaning of or the, the acrostic will stand for H-O-P-E. First, we have to hear well God's message to you. So the depression does not happen by accident. It does not happen by circumstances only. There is always a message. That is why we have to hear well God's message to you. And when we hear the message of God, we obey His word. And P stands for preach God's love to yourself. And finally, encircle yourself with Christ's committed followers or believers. So hear God's message to you. So your depression may have been permitted by God to warn you. Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So maybe you are living your life on, our, on your own apart from the will of God. So God has afflicted you and you get depressed, but now I keep your word. So the depression is no longer there. To rely on Him in your weakness. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in my weakness. So the sufficiency of a person is the greatest enemy of our dependence of God. So when we say, apart from God, I can do nothing, it must be real to you. So we have to rely on him. Your depression may have been permitted by God to mature you in your faith. James 1, 2-4 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, testing is a difficult word because it's not comfortable, produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. To mature you in your faith. Another one, to confirm your worth and value. We are going through depression or discouragement at times. For God says, Are you not, or are not five sparrows sold for two cents? 
yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than sparrows. Let it lodge in our heart, let it lodge in our brains that we are the apple of God's eyes. So no matter what you are going through, whether you are suffering in relationships, you are going through a disease that you find no comfort and it's causing you so much discomfort, or you are going through a difficulty that you can find no answer, always remember that you are the apple of God's eyes. And then he permitted it to increase compassion to others. You know, sometimes people will be more compassionate when they themselves suffer affliction or difficulty because they can empathize. Second Corinthians says, The Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have comforted by God. So God himself will comfort us so that we will be able to comfort others. We do not say, okay lang yan, get out of it. It's not like that. But we will tell them how God comforted us during our times of depression and share it to the people who are at the same time expressing depression. Cancer people, uh, people who experience cancer have been more empathetic of those who are suffering cancer now. People who have experienced difficulty and pain in the hospital and it's so debilitating and it's so painful are the very people who can empathize and comfort people who are going through difficulties in life. People who are widowed, people who are alone in life will be the very same people who will be able to comfort those who are just widowed, those who are just suffering through pains. Because of this, there will always be a reason why you are going through it. And let's go back there. He lay down, referring to Elijah, and slept under the juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. So look at this. God prepared for him. God cooked for him. The angel cooked for him. And then when he woke up, arise and eat, then the angel said, okay, you sleep again. Understanding that even Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, need to have rest. Don't overestimate yourself. You need to rest just like everybody else. You are not Superman, you know. You have your limitations. Do not take on weights and loads and stress that are so unnecessary. You will break the bow if you always keep it in bent. You know, when you tight a bow and then not rest it for a while, it will be brittle because of the stress. So in the same way, we have to take some rest. We don't overestimate ourselves just like what happened to Elijah. And the angel of the Lord came again in, sec in the second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he is now preparing Elijah for a journey farther down south, about 200 miles. That is more or less 300 kilometers from Beersheba down to where? So he arose and ate, drunk, and went the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. This is where the nation of Israel began, or another term, as the scholars say, Mount Sinai. So he will go there, and he traveled 40 days and 40 nights. So this is a stock number saying that the travel was so long. And that place, he wants to encounter God. So what can we learn from this? Make it a habit to listen to God every day. Because if we don't listen to God and we don't want God to hear our cries, our pleading, then we open ourselves to the possibility of depression because the moment we see the problem compounding another problem, then there we go again. We will have fits of depression. So make it a habit to listen to God every day. Psalm 143 verse 8 says, Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. 
Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. That is why it is important to talk to God and to listen to Him every day. That's what we call the quiet time, reading and meditating the Word of God. John 5.14 is an encouragement to us. And we, the believers, are confident that He hears us. So the moment we talk to Him every day, whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him, and since we know He hears us, when we make a request, we also know that He will give us what we ask for. So when we pray according to the Word of God, when we say, Lord, please help me in this thing. I cannot fight this. Help me. Then He will hear us and then He will answer our prayers. Then moving on, then He came to the cave and lodged there and behold, the Word of the Lord came to Him and said to Him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So the Lord already knows the answer, but He was just talking to Him. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, I alone am left, and they seek my life. So he was complaining to the Lord, Lord, nag-iisa na lang ako. I am the only ones left standing for you. But in reality, there are 7,000 other prophets or believers who does not bow their knees to Baal. And he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking the pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. So the Lord was simply saying, there are times that you will not see God in power and great wonders, but you can hear Him in silence like a gentle wind blowing. It's like, like that. So Elijah heard the Lord was saying. So it's not in the fire, it's not in the earthquake, it's not in the wind, but just in moments of solitude. So when we are praying in silence, when we are bowing down, we are reading the Bible let the Word of God pierce our hearts. Let the Word of God lodge into our brain. Let the magnificence of His theology cut our hearts because that is where we will hear the message of God as Elijah heard once. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face with a mantle and went out and stood. So he was closing his face in the entrance of the cave and behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Again, he stated his complaint the second time, and I alone am left and seek my life and take it away. The Lord told him again, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you are there, anoint Hazael king of Aram, also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and anoint Elijah son of Shaphat from Abel, Meholah to succeed. So these three people are the very people that Elijah will anoint to accomplish God's purposes for the nation of Israel. Hasa, Hazael is an Arabian king, a pa pagan king that will cause external punishment to the nation of Israel to destroy them. And also, he will be raising up internal punishment through King Jehu later on, again, to wipe out idolatry and Elisha, his successor, to preach repentance to the nation of Israel. So there will be an accomplishment. There will be something that Elijah has to accomplish by anointing these people. So, hope in God, hear well God's message to you, and obey God's word. So we have a series on this, and I won't belabor on this so much, but basically, obeying God's word is when we know the word of God, when he has spoken to you. James says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. So we should not just say, okay, I'm done with my, my quiet time, what now? You obey it. Do it even single small steps at a time. Next, we have preach God's love to yourself. Preach God's love to yourself. In Ephesians 6.12, why we need to preach God's love to yourself? Why? 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So our, so our enemy is not natural. Our enemy is supernatural. The devil himself, where on this world there is no equal. I'd like to quote the famous song by Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Here is his description of the evil one. He says here in his song, For still our ancient foe, referring to the devil, do seek to work as woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. So you and me are not his equal, and he has armed himself with cruel hate. Did we in our strength confide, our striving would be losing. So no matter how hard we try to fight him, we cannot fight him. Our striving would be losing. Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This is the enemy, always ready to pounce at the next given opportunity. So preach God's love to yourself. Most of our unhappiness comes when you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. So the moment we wake up, problems come to our mind from the past days or the past weeks, and then it causes us depression again. So instead of listening to them, from inside, we have to talk to ourselves. Talk to ourselves about the love of God. Psalm 42 says, Hope in God. Why are you despair, O my soul? So he was talking to himself, not listening to the problems. Of course, there are problems, but first talk to yourself about the truth of the gospel. One antidote for depression is to meditate on God's word. And that is why that 15 minutes to one hour you spend every day on the word of God is really a very good, effective, potent antidepressant. Sila yung gamot natin. The antidepressants can just treat the symptoms, but later on, when depression comes again, you go back to it. But the best antidepressant we can ever have is the Word of God. And he goes on, Who is this person? A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark or a castle or a fortress or a fortification never failing. Our helper amidst, amidst the flood of mortals ill prevailing. So our ills will always be prevailing, but we have a helper. Do ask who that might be? Christ Jesus, it is He. The Lord of hosts is His name from age to age the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How He helped Elijah overcome depression is the same way how He will help you in your time of discouragement and depression. Romans 8.31 is a very good verse. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor angels, nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things in the present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So preach this in your hearts. If you are going through difficulties, this is the great antidote. The love of God, which can never be separated from us. And the mighty fortress continues, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little, world, one little word shall fell him. So what will fill the devil? What will destroy the devil? One little word of God. So when we douse ourselves with the Word of God every day, when we saturate our minds, our consciousness, and our awareness with the very words of God, then we will be able to overcome 
depression. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So moving on, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So if there is a depression state, it will just be temporary. I, know, I don't know how long that temporary definition is. It can be short, it can be weeks, it can be months, it can be years, or it can be for the rest of our lives. But we know that God himself will restore you probably today, tomorrow, the next week, the next month, the next year, and make you strong, firm, and steadfast, stable, standing firmly against the weathering of the storms of life. And Hebrews said, keep yourselves from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we will say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. So if you're going through difficulties in your life, you write down in your notes, in your journals, the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. It's not just a ra 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 sis bomba like a cheering squad, but it's reality lodged deeply in our hearts and our consciousness so that when we walk outside our prayer time, we will look at the day with new confidence in our hearts. That is preaching God's love to yourself. And finally, encircle yourself with Christ-committed followers or believers. Surround your people who will strengthen you. And he was afraid. This is what happened to Elijah. He was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servants there. You should not go away from your group who will always strengthen you. Don't separate from relationships that strengthen you. If you have quarrels with your spouse, your spouse is your greatest advocate while you're still here on earth. Fix that relationship. If you have been joining your D groups, join all the more. Do not stay far away because there are the very people who will strengthen your relationship with your God. Avoid the peril of solitary life. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. Even Lone Ranger has his sidekick. Batman as his Robin. Have your happy few in your life. Who are these happy few? These are the very people who will not hesitate to tell you the truth in love, who will correct you, who will counsel you. These are the very people you are willing to die with in your life. And when all the history of your life will be gone, when the curtains will fall, and when you will be six feet below the ground, these are the very people who will be surrounding that grave, who will be sobbing and crying for their loss because you are already gone. But they are the very people who will cry with expectation and joy that one day you will be seeing each other on the other side of heaven, fellowshipping forever and ever in the presence of the Holy God. Have this happy few. And that is why we encourage everybody, everyone in this room, to join a small group, to join your discipleship group. This is the place where you can create and have your own happy few. Your band of brothers. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So these are the times that you have to have your one another in the right context. So encircle yourself with Christ-committed followers. They are the influencers. They say you are the average of five people you always go along with. So who you are will be the average of the five people you are very, very close with. So encircle yourself. And finally, Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him, Christ, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So when everything seems dark, 
everything seems trying, everything seems hopeless, and you say, I want to surrender anymore, my mind is numb and I can no longer function, look to Christ because in looking up to Christ, you will not grow weary. Even if you're in the state of depression, you will be given wings like that of the eagles. And then you will be rejuvenated. You will be given victory upon victory because Christ is always ever present in front of you. When you are weak, then you will be strong because Christ is in you. You say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's why I will be able to face tomorrow as the song goes, with Christ in my vessel. I can smile at the storm. Let us all stand and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. Father, I don't know, Lord, what many of us are going through right now. Maybe you have spoken to them. And definitely, you have touched the hearts of these people. We pray, dear God, that if they are wondering where is God, you are always beside them. And we just pray, dear God, that you will touch their hearts, draw them to yourself, empower them, Lord, to experience your saving power and goodness. And for us, Lord, who have been blessed to live a life overcoming depression and thriving to depression and living victorious lives, we pray, Father God, that you will give us a heart that will wait for those who are a little slow, Lord, in growing. We pray that you will give us a heart of compassion that will be able to comfort those who are going through difficulties in life because you have said you will always be with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you once again, Lord. And as we leave this place, we pray that your blessing and your special favor be upon all of your children. And everybody say, Amen and Amen.